title is just cryptography from black art to popular science and, and that really you, you've always given the lecture for me I can go home really because really 40 50 years ago everyone was scared of cryptography it was a black art it really was um, regarded as sinister now what, every week the sun has on the front page was it encrypted or disk loss was it encrypted should it have been encrypted and encryption and cryptography are now in the public domain very much so and I just want to look at some of the changes that have happened and why and the object of the lecture is really to, to enjoy ourselves if I don't enjoy myself I get bored if I get bored you'll get bored and if you get bored we must all just pack up so I really want to have some fun I want to look at some of the implementation issues of cryptographic systems and not really get into anything technical at all and then maybe just look at some of the social changes and how it affects our lives. The whole thing started here because I was asked by the government to find out what um, problems industry was having with cryptography. And here's some of the answers. The, the whole gist of it was that algorithms are not our problem. Cryptographic algorithms are specialist art, people can design them, some people can do it, some people can't. We don't care. What we're worried about, and so the first thing just is, we've got no problems with the algorithms, it's just the wraparounds, the overheads, whatever you want to call it, that are the problem. Then there were some serious concerns about recent events, the DigiNotes are, and I'll explain exactly what that recent event was if we get that far. They're not sure how they should be regarding the possibility of quantum computers because everybody keeps saying quantum computers may come if quantum computers come modern cryptography is dead so they, that was concern and then cryptography needs standards which change slowly but they need flexibility and typically consultants get coming in and saying change your hardware and they kept saying we can't afford change our hardware we only bought it last year and you guys keep changing the ground rules so quickly that we just can't keep up so if we can't keep up we might as well just ignore you and that's what they're doing and there were concerns, as I say, the thing about the hardware. And they wanted advice. So here's my history of the um, history of cryptography. Pre-1975, it was just hush-hush, in the sense it really was just practiced by governments and military and not much else. Then in the early 1980s, courses started and customers really started to know what they required. In the 90s, the early 90s, qualifications started and we found, because we started one of the early qualifications, that people were coming who had been security managers for 20 years without knowing what they were doing. And it was sort of a punishment. First job that went was, you know, whatever project it was, whatever you wanted, whatever you wanted, whatever you wanted, can't sack you, security manager. So the security manager was almost the Last thing. Now it's a popular science, and it really is a popular science. It's also fundamental to e-commerce, e-government, etc. It affects your life in so many ways that you'll just wonder. Because popular does not mean easy. Golf is a popular sport. I don't play golf, but now and again people have got me to try and hit this flipping ball miles, and occasionally I hit it where, and it sails off. And I'm so pleased with myself, and I try to do it again, and I can't. So anybody can hit the golf ball now and again. But if you want to be a professional, it's hard work, it needs training and practice, and it's a specialist art just like everything else. Well, so is cryptography. But because cryptography is now in the public limelight, and mainly because of the Da Vinci Code and things, I'm often asked now, who is our best student? And of course, I don't ask them. For a number of different reasons. One is I don't know, don't know what the question means, and secondly, it wouldn't be fair to anybody to label them with, well, Fred says you're the best student he's seen, so everybody would try and shoot him down or whatever. But we do know who our most famous ex student is, and it's this lady. Who's this lady? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a, blah, 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 blah. that's a real name. In the film, she was Sophie Neveu. And Holloway is attributed in the book as having trained her. And you, know, you get academic accolades and they, they do a bit for you, but getting mentioned in that book was the biggest thing that ever happened to Holloway. I had to, the book was dreadful, but I had to read it and be interviewed on it by all sorts of people. 
And giving lectures like this in one lecture, someone actually asked me a serious question, what was she like as a student? And I'm not often struck for words, but I wasn't quite sure what to say, but fortunately everybody in the audience laughed. <laughs> So I was able to laugh, and I just said, oh, not bad, and went on. But it really got people. She is certainly our most famous ex-student. What was her real name? Audrey Tatum, whatever. Sophie Neveu to me, <laughs> always. And so why is the profile of encryption growing? Well, there are a number of different reasons why a lot of you are here, why you're in really jobs. Can I just ask, by the way, I mean, most of you presumably are not students. You, you have jobs that involve cryptography or involve security or? We work for the city council in um, the sort of security field. Yeah. <coughs> so you're not cryptographers? No. I'm a project manager in a sort of an IS arena. So you're relying on that. Yeah. Yes. To have those skills. That doesn't mean. So you use cryptography but you don't. It's just like driving a car. No, you just find out about it, but it's not my own. No, that's fine. Okay. No. Very good reason. Anyway, what's happened is that there's just volumes of communications now go over insecure channels. And people are often concerned that people are snooping on it. Well, I mean, I'm not going to say all that much about Snowden unless you ask me, but the Snowden thing has been great for cryptography, the profile of cryptography, for the profile of security too. I mean, it's really pushed it up everybody's mind. But there are also regulatory requirements for adequate protection of data. The Data Protection Act does not actually specify the use of encryption, but it will soon. At the moment, it just says you must have adequate or appropriate, I forget which word it uses, um, protection, but it's going to, it, it'll, it means cryptography. And then, of course, it can be fun, and it is fun. And that's the main message I want to get out to you. Don't be scared of it, enjoy it. Where did it all start? Bletchley Park. If you haven't been to Bletchley Park, I guess it's a long way from here, you should go. It really is where cryptography started in the Second World War and the exploits there are famous and Turing keeps on getting celebrated but Turing was certainly not the only cryptographer there, there a massive great team there of people. That was 45. It's considered the start of modern cryptography but modern cryptography didn't really start until 1975. Why? Because there was a 30 year embargo that prevented people talking about what happened at Bletchley Park. So, although modern cryptography really started in 45, or 39 to 45, in reality we didn't know about it until 75, so the, the practicalities, are, although that was the start of it, we didn't know it had started until 30 years after it had been running. And the important changes since 45, it's really been, well, there are so many changes since 45 that the world is just different. I mean, but basically technology, the advent of software, the advent of fast computers, the advent of new communications media, the advent of binary code. Then there's been an increase in general awareness, many applications for cryptography other than the provision of confidentiality. Public key cryptography has arrived. And it's also now seen as much part of a wider discipline, which is information security. And I'll come on to that a bit later, but as a cryptographer, I'm quite happy to say cryptography on its own is useless. All it can do is protect data either when it's stored somewhere or when it's transmitted over some link. If you don't look after it the rest of the time, then what's the point in protecting it on this communication link? So you have to see it as just a wider part of this much bigger subject called Information security. What is information security? Well, there are many definitions and I don't want to get too deeply now, but if you take the CIE definition, confidentiality, integrity and availability, then what does confidentiality and integrity mean? Well, amongst other things, it means that somebody is deemed to be owning some information and they're controlling it, or whatever word you want to use, whether you use it, controlling, owning it, or whatever, and they decide who they want to see it, who they're happy to change it, etc. And then they have to take steps to make sure that nobody who they don't want to see it can see it, 
or nobody if they don't want to change it can change it the common word up there is unauthorized right you protecting information from unauthorized disclosure integrity is protecting information from unauthorized modification the whole point about this word unauthorized is you've got to be able to recognize who is authorized. So authentication is really the cornerstone of information security and of cryptography. There is no point having a secure conversation you don't know who you're having it with. There's no point sharing a cryptographic algorithm with someone if you don't know who they are. So authentication is crucial. Now, I like telling jokes, I mean, I, I think life's a joke. So. Uh, you, you all know the story, do you, about how the importance of authentication and the guy who beats the grandmaster at chess? Well, I, I'll tell you the story anyway. Even if you know it, forget it, pretend you don't. Young guy, arrogant as hell, confident as hell, announces to the world he can beat the grandmaster at chess. And he says, no, I... I can beat the first two. I play them simultaneously and beat them both. So he, what he does, he goes, in one room he plays one of them, in another room he plays another one. So he starts off with the first one, makes a move, then goes off the second one, and all he does is have them playing each other by mimicking the move that one's done on the other one's game. So he's guaranteed to either stalemate with both these masters or beat one of them. Why? Because they're playing each other. So he's, he's acting as just a man in the middle. He's cheating. <laughs> it's an appropriate term. But that's an example of why you need to be authenticate who you're communicating with. Now, the early definition of a cipher system is the following. You've got a message you want to make it send it over an insecure channel, that's what the interceptor being there means. Insecure just means someone can intercept it. And what you do is you um, take the message, you encrypt it using the encryption algorithm and a key, that produces a cryptogram which is a scrambled version of the message. That's what the interceptor sees. The interceptor should have no idea what the message is from, just from the cryptogram, but the process got reversible, so the receiver has a decryption algorithm which reverses the process and tells him the message. And this is a very artistically correct diagram because it's the early definition and those two keys are the same. Of course, it's a very cheating and in incomplete diagram because it begs the issue of how the keys got there. And in order for the keys to get there, you need a second, what's called key establishment channel, which has to be secure, because you can't let people intercept the key, otherwise they can decrypt the message. So all the old systems relied the second key establishment channel. And if you read, for instance, the history of the Second World War, how did they break the algorithms? Well, really, they didn't break the album at all. What they did was they looked at the key establishment channel, managed to intercept that, and that enabled them to determine the keys, which then enabled them to break the algorithm. So, let's just concentrate on confidentiality, because that's how we always introduce cryptography. First simple question, how do you keep a secret? Easy, just don't tell anyone. And so cryptography is not really about keeping secrets, it's about how you share secrets. Right? How do I share a secret with you so nobody else knows it? If I, if I have some information I don't want anybody to know it at all, I just don't tell anyone. And if I don't tell anyone, how the hell can anybody know it? So cryptography is really about um, authorizing people and being prepared to share that information with them. And then, if you want to share it with someone, you have to sort of transmit it or do something, so you disguise it, and one way of disguising it is 
using cryptography. And cryptography relies on shared secrets. They rely on trust. I'm never going to define precisely what I mean by trust. But you have to trust people, you have to trust processes, and you have to trust technology. And the discussion we had earlier, what is people realizing more and more, is that people are often so-called weakest link. So the human factor side of the whole of information security is jumping up the scale. But if you use cryptography to protect your information, then there's going to be a key to which you must deny everybody access. And that key is going to be crucial because if that key is lost, and the algorithm's a good one, then your data is lost forever. And you've just got to face up to that fact. So if you trust other bodies with your keys, <laughs> tough. <laughs> if they lose it, you're in trouble. So things like the cloud are fine. But where's your key? Who's got your key? Who's looking after your key? Do you trust them with your key? Because if you gain, gain access to that key, then it will have access to your information. If you lose the key, then you've lost the data. And I used to make a living a long time ago designing algorithms. And people, more than one occasion, said, can you design an algorithm you can't break? Of course I can. It's easy. So you design an algorithm, you can't break it. Then they come up and say, Fred, I've lost the key. Tough. But surely you can find the key for me. You didn't tell what the key was. You asked me to design an algorithm I can't break. I can't break it. Can anybody break it? I don't know. That's up to you to find out. I mean, if you lose that key, you've lost it. And so giving that key to someone is the ultimate in trust. So what does breaking an algorithm mean? We just mean to be able to get the plain text from the, from the cryptogram without being given the key. And so there's one ex why they always attack it, just brute force attack or exhaustive key search. You just try each key in turn. It's called guessing. You call it statistical, so it's just being lucky. And sometimes you might get it first time, sometimes you might not get it forever. But you cannot stop anybody guessing anything. So if you only have a small number of keys, you're screwed because people just guess, and the chance of them guessing will be good. So you need a large number of keys purely to stop people guessing it. Could they guess it first time? Of course. But if you've got a million keys, then you've got a one in a million chance of guessing it first time. If you say, oh, I can't, that's too risky, then I have a million million keys. Then they've got a one in a million million times of guessing it first time. If you don't like those odds, then have a million million keys. But you decide the odds by having how many keys you've got. You can't stop them guessing. Doesn't matter how design, well designed the algorithm is, you cannot prevent them guessing the keys. And that broker is a very emotive word. And if you look at the literature, you'll see all sorts of systems are broken. Often, often, not always, but often, the breaking comes from academics trying to shoot Jesse James or become famous for something or other. And the break is genuine, but in conditions that don't bother the people using the systems. So whenever you see something broken, you must always understand the assumptions associated with that term. And then in your particular system, see if those assumptions are relevant. And if someone breaks it under assumptions that don't bother you, then carry on using it. It is a straightforward thing when someone announces the system is broken, some of the attacks are perfectly genuine, some are slightly artificial, some are academics creating them. For cryptography, they're basically, for, for tracking algorithms, there's ciphertext only, that means you just intercept a message and from that you can break the algorithm. Sometimes it's known plain text, where you know some corresponding plain text and ciphertext, and other times you can actually choose the plain text and ciphertext. And if you, again, if you read the 
history of the Second World War. Now and again, people attack the algorithm, the Allies attack the Germans' algorithms by doing chosen plain text attacks because what they did was bomb a town or a thing with a distinctive name so they knew the name would appear in the message, it would of course be encrypted, and that's then what would give them the chance to find the thing. So chosen plain text attacks sometimes work, known plain text attacks, ciphertext only. Now, I'm sure you've met many information security careers other than me, but when cryptographers start doing this, it means they're lying. So the secure channel concept is almost a, in, is almost a contradiction in terms. Right? A channel is insecure if you can, someone can intercept. So all public channels basically are insecure. And that's it. The secure channel in inverted commas means you take an insecure channel and you try to make it secure in practice so that even though people can intercept, they can't understand what they're intercepting. And so it's putting inverted commas, and you can see me because I'm doing it. <laughs> and you know I'm lying in some sense, but you take the endpoints and you make them secure often by using cryptography. And so the services you offer is data origin authentication, so one end knows who originated the, the data. Data integrity, that's where the receiver knows that the message hasn't been changed. And confidentiality, as we've discussed many times. And cryptography is, no doubt, in this context, a very important tool. But, Cryptography is not the same as security. It's just a tiny piece of a very big puzzle. It's an important bit, and I'm not apologizing, it's very important, but it's a, it's a small but important one. And most systems break elsewhere. They break because the incorrect requirements or specifications they use. They break because they're implemented badly. They break at the application level, they break through social engineering. And notice, again, social engineering crops there because that is becoming one of the main attacks on systems. Nothing clever, nothing technical, just straightforward social engineering. Ring up, I've forgotten my password, I'm Joe Bloggs. Oh, you can't make me not do that. I don't know. And so the lady will give you someone else's password. That's it. So why do these breaches happen? Well, there are many different reasons. Badly designed systems, inappropriate policies. What should a password policy be? Well, whatever a password policy should be, and I'm not going to get involved in dictating what it should be, it should be something that fits the um, culture of your company and something that people can follow. So if you say to people who have 37 different accounts, all of your passwords should be randomly generated, whatever that means. They should be 15 characters long. They should contain uppercase, lowercase, numbers, punctuation marks. They should be different for every system. They should be changed every day and you should never write them down. Then you present your users with a problem and you force them to break your own policy. Now, if you're doing that, then you better have a bloody good help desk. Because the help desk is going to be really saturated. So you, but nevertheless, if you're really worried about people doing these searches for passwords, then that's what you may have to do. So you just have to allow them to write something down, maybe. On the other hand, if like me, you're more worried about locking yourself out of your system, than you are about other people breaking in, then I need nice simple things I can remember. So it depends what you're worried about and the, the, the policy will relate to where you are. So how do you attack cryptographic systems? Well if you're a passive attack interceptor then you just try to break the 
break the algorithm. But if you're an active interceptor, then you have many more options. And what you have to remember is interception is not necessarily the best form of attack. And so the interceptor might do might attack protocols, they might attack the key management, they might attack the hardware, they might impersonate genuine users, which is the um, social engineer again, or they might just result to spies and torture and good old fashioned, you know, put your fingernails out if you don't tell me the key type thing. Now, is it built on a sound basis? It's a very interesting question. And, um, there's a man called Donald Davis, who maybe you don't know, but he was a very eminent scientist, often, well, I guess his main claim to fame was inventing packet switching, which is, he worked for NPL, he worked with Turing and so on. And he was a friend of mine. And I was having trouble, because I was a mathematician in those days. I said, will you come to the London Mathematical Society? and give a lecture on public key cryptography. He said, of course I will. He said, will you use this slide, put this up for me? He said, yeah. So he put this up with, to the, the most exalted mathematicians in the country. Many cryptographic systems run the inability of mathematicians to do mathematics. Now, what did he mean? Well, he was goading them, bless him, And he certainly had his tongue in his cheek because he was just trying to arouse some, provoke some interest. But on the other hand, what did he really mean? Well, at that time, RSA was just about being established as a public key algorithm. And the security of RSA depends on not being able to factor the modulus. But I can write down an algorithm that will factor any modulus you like. For i equals 1 up to root n, divide n by i. If the answer is not, you know, if it doesn't work, you haven't got a factor, so increase i by 1 and try again. And that only takes me four lines to write it. And it must work. The trouble is that your grandchildren will be dead before the answer comes out of the computer. So, you've got to realise that existence proof do not provide solutions. Right? Knowing that the number can be factorised is easy. It's a standard thing about it. Prime factorisation theorem guarantees any number can be factorised. What he really meant was that it's no good having your high th theoretical attacks on systems if, they, if you can't make them work. So are today's algorithms fortune-proof? Well, for symmetric algorithms, if they're well designed, then key searches are the best attack. And so the main concern is just advances in technology. For asymmetric, there's always concern about mathematical advances and quantum computing is hovering around there somewhere. For hash functions, confidence has been shaken. And so the never-ending debate is what gives us confidence in an algorithm? Standards? Well, not really. I mean, standards don't tell you very much. So you ask the opinion of experts. Well, who, which expert do you trust? And see, so the early debate was, should you use an algorithm that's been in the public domain or a proprietary one? And in those days, it was quite an early serious debate because there weren't many published algorithms. Now we've got AES and double des or triple des, whatever you call it. So this is, but the important thing is the fact that an algorithm is published and unbroken says nothing about its strength because people may just sort of try to break it. So the mere fact that you can produce for me an algorithm that was published in 1986 and hasn't been broken since it tells me nothing unless you can find <laughs> genuine attacks. Now, the data encryption standard was attacked because that was an algorithm worth attacking. But on the whole, I mean, there are a few academics in the room, 
an academic who submits a paper and it says, well, here's this algorithm, I tried to break it, I couldn't. No one's going to publish it. Why should they? <laughs> so there's no mileage in people trying to break algorithms unless they're high profile algorithms or unless they're paid for it. And Kirchhoff's principle. Kirchhoff's principle says the security of cryptographic system should not depend on keeping the encryption algorithm secret. That's fine. What it does not say is the encryption algorithm must be made public. And there's a whole lot of debate about whether a system could be secure and its algorithm be secret. Well, of course it could. But if you're requesting the security, al security of a cryptographic system, then you need to have confidence that the algorithm's strong. How do you get that confidence? That's hard. And the financial institutions use public algorithms where appropriate because those public algorithms like the data encryption standard or the triple data encryption standard or the AES give them the confidence, give the public the confidence that the banks know that they're looking after your money in the sense that no one's going to break the algorithm. They may have other flaws in their systems, but the algorithms are fine. My favourite slide. Right, it's a fact of life, right? In theory, there's no difference between theory and practice. But in practice, there bloody well is. In practice, there's the hell of a difference between theory and practice. Theory works, and often practice doesn't. To give you an example, I'm going to quote the public key algorithm system, the RSA. Now, if you if this is beyond you just fall asleep for two minutes because I'll come back and think. But in, in RSA you have a number called the modulus which is the product of two secret primes and it's published. So the product, that just means you multiply them together, you publish the answer, but you keep the prime secret which means you're happy that people can't factor this published number and discover the two primes. Knowledge of the secret primes would make it easy to find the private key. And in general, the, determining the private key appears to require knowledge of the primes. Factorization is a difficult problem, recognized. And so if a large moduli RSA is secure, that's the theory. And there's nothing wrong with that theory, except that the theory is assuming that to factor in, you're going to use one of these mathematical factorization theorems. In practice, that may not be so. And in the early attacks, the prime generator can only generate something like a million primes. And so all you needed to do to break an RSA implementation was get hold of the prime generator, generate all the primes, try each one in turn, find one that they've used, and you've broken it. The theory and the practice didn't tie together. So did we learn from these early mistakes? Well, in theory, yes. But of course, in practice, no. So what happened? Well, while factoring a number is undoubtedly, or I'm confident, it's a very difficult problem, finding the greatest common divisor of two numbers is easy. Easy in the sense that I could convince any of you non-mathematicians to do it in five minutes. Just take the two numbers, you divide the bigger one by the smaller one, look at the remainder, and then divide the smaller of the two numbers you started with the remainder, just keep iterating the process until you end up with nothing. So finding the greatest common divisor, all it is. So recent research by a very respected man called Arjun Lenstra, showed that he took a sample of 6.6 .6 million RSA keys and they found that over 4% over of them either actually had the same modulus 
which is almost unbelievable because there's just so many primes that this should never happen, or had moduli sharing a common prime factor. Which means that they're not implementing the theory correctly. No explanation given as to, to why. But it led to a rather cynical Argent Lentra, James Hughes. I forget the other names, sorry. All these people did was they went to the certificates that were published, took the moduli and used those, so they used public information. It meant that in 4% of all these people, they could compromise their system because the public key was published and they could factor it without breaking the factorization algorithm. So if exploited, it could affect the expectation that the public key infrastructure is intended to achieve. In other words, it shouldn't happen. And the theory, the practice still isn't quite good enough. But of course, cryptography is not just about algorithms. In the early 1980s, Fournier and I held a conference called Security is People. I remember it very well because I thought the grammar was wrong. <laughs> uh, but it, it's actually, I think the grammar is probably correct. And then in 1990s, Michael Ross Anderson from Cambridge published a paper called Why Crypto Systems Fail. And that's a very interesting read. If you read it, it doesn't say because the algorithms are crap. It's, it's all the surrounding things. It goes back almost to that first slide I put up. And this was in the early 90s. So he, he got together, and I think it was 10 reasons, I forget the exact number. But it's a paper you should read because it's, it makes it quite plain that you have to regard crypto as part of information security and it makes it quite plain that the algorithm is relatively easy bit of it. Now the use of strong algorithms prevents attackers from calculating or guessing keys. But these keys need to be stored and distributed throughout the system. So these keys need protection. Right? You're, you, you're trying to protect data information. That's fine. And you're going to use encryption. That's fine. But encryption uses keys. That's fine. But these keys are going to be protected. So how are you going to protect them? Well, one possibility is to rely on physical protection. And so we have things called tamper-resistant security modules. And then some people use cryptographic keys with smart cards. And there's a very interesting debate about how tamper resistant are smart cards. I'm not an expert, I don't know. Um, or you could split the key up into components and make sure that the components are never combined except inside a physically secure environment. Or you can use key hierarchies where you just use some keys to protect other keys. So the key hierarchy is this key is protected by this key, this key is protected by this key, this key is protected by this key, and so on. But if you use a key hierarchy, what protects the one at the top? Well, nothing. No, no other cryptographic key. So you can't rely totally on key hierarchies. And so the keys at the top even if you are using key hierarchy, probably need physical security or to at least be kept apart in the system. And then when they're combined, that should take place inside physical protection. So it's not just about algorithms now, because this, this, this is a problem. You, if you're implementing systems that have cryptographic systems, cryptographic algorithms in them, you've got to have a key management system. And you've got to know what you're relying on. And you can't have every key encrypted by another key because it doesn't quite work. Sorry? Yeah? So, 
people then started looking, we're now, now sort of in about the early 90s or something, people then started looking, well, let's, let's start not worrying about breaking the algorithms, let's assume the algorithms, we can't break them, let's attack the devices. The devices are actually holding the keys that implement the, cryptograph the cryptography. So you had side channel attacks. Now, an exhaustive key search attack just tried to find the secret key by random trial and error. You just keep guessing and you, you need some way of knowing whether the key's right or wrong. Usually you know whether it's wrong or not and you guess, get the right key by an elimination process of eliminating wrong keys. Shaitan tries to use additional information drawn from the physical implementation of the algorithm. And so it gives you something substantially better than trial and error. And this was a, almost started by a man called Kosher. And these side channel attacks literally change the way cryptographers think about security. How would it work? Well, if you take, uh, let's take RSA for instance, I, I don't get technical details, but in RSA you had to raise a number to some power. And so the standard algorithm for doing that would be you write the power in binary terms, and then when there was a naught, you just squared the number you had, and if there's a one, you squared the number you had and multiplied by the original number. So whenever there was a one in the exponent, then the process was a bit longer or a bit more power consuming or whatever than when there was a naught in there. And this gave information. And differential power attacks, differential cryptanalysis and so on, all, they all came along this way. And then and the recent changes now, more attacks are concentrating on the implementation of the algorithm and the accompanying protocols. And some exploit error messages, and academic research is certainly becoming less blue skies and focusing on the real systems and the real problems. And theory and practice are at last getting together. Now I said that we concentrate on error messages. What are error messages? Well, error messages are there to tell you something's gone wrong. And most of you will have ATM cards and will go to ATMs and will put your card in and occasionally the ATM will say you can't have any money. And it will tell you why. And the system is just trying to help you. Right? The system is trying to help you. And the typical error message you might see is you got the pin wrong, or you've got insufficient funds in your account, or you've exceeded your daily limit. Now just suppose that I were a villain. I'm not, I'm not an honest man, but let's suppose I were. And I just happen to um, be standing behind you when you put your pin in. And I saw you through the digits you entered, but I couldn't quite get the fourth one. So what do I do? Well, I get my friend to pick your pocket and I've got your card now and I've got three of the four digits. So all I've got to do is guess this last, this last digit. So I put the card in and I make a guess. Well, if it tells me I've got the wrong pin, then it's helping my attack. If it tells me you've got insufficient funds in your account, then it tells me to throw this card away because this bloke's not worth robbing. If it tells me you've exceeded your daily limit, then I just come back at midnight and get your money. So these error messages, in fact, could be interpreted as aids to a villain. Now, they're not, I mean, sorry, I mean, but there are other environments and other situations where the error message is literally exploited in real circumstances to get real attacks on real systems. And this is a very good example because these do give attackers in an artificial situation, it was an artificial situation I created, but they're there to help you 
And they do help you, because if you put in the wrong pin, you know, oh, I've used the wrong, yeah. I must have got two G's wrong or something. You just try again. But error messages can be, and often are now, exploited. So with public key systems, right, the, your public key is something you want everybody to know. It's not like symmetric cryptography where you had to keep your encryption key secret. Now you want everybody to know what your public key is. But the important thing now is not, because it's been replaced by the need to keep it secret, you haven't got a free ride, you've got another problem now. Because what you want to make sure is that anybody who thinks they're using your public key does in fact have your public key. So you want to be sure that you know who owns each public key. And if that sounds double dutch, then just think of the early credit card systems. In the early credit card systems, what happened is you got this card through the post, nice virgin white stripe on the back, with a little letter that says, as soon as you get this, sign on the back. And then when you took it to buy something, your signature was used as authenticating you, which is fine. But what happened if I got your card before you did? Well, I couldn't forge your signature because I've never seen it. I might be able to forge Steve's because I've seen his once or twice, but, but nobody else in the room have I ever seen your signature, so I couldn't forge your signature. But I didn't need to. I would just write your name in my handwriting, and your name's on the front of that card. Right? So I can't forge your signature because I've never seen it. But I can read and I can write. So I take your card, I read your name from the front and I write it on the back in my handwriting. Then when I go to the store to buy something and they give me a chit, what do I do? If I'm awake, I write your name in my handwriting again. The storekeeper checks, they match. So it gives me the goods, and you pay. That's great. So what have I done? What I've really done is got your name in my handwriting, authenticated by the system as your signature. And the cryptographic equivalent to that is getting your public key, or getting my public key attributed to you. So there's, it's a real, real, real issue. And the solution to the earlier credit card problem was nothing to do with using signatures as a signature base, as an authentication base. It was the distribution method of the um, cards in the first place. How do you know whose um, signature, you, whose public key you're using? Well, you have something called a certification authority. And what that does it's digitally signed certificates that binds the user's ID to their public key. And then you, you can combine CAs, but at the end, however you combine the root CA that sits at the top, and their private key controls everything. And if their private key is compromised, then the whole network is kaput. And that's what happened with DigiNotar. DigiNotar was a top-level certification authority. It was actually accredited by the Dutch government, I think it's Dutch government. Yeah. Um, and it was compromised. Not through breaking any algorithm, but by um, social engineering and various other attacks on the system and that plus certain other attacks like the attack on the RSA what are RSA now called EMC squared is it EMC squared are they bought RSA Just EMC. EMC is it the secure ID token right that 
And that, that, did you know to unsaw them? Then started people saying, who and what can we trust? Because if you can't trust anything, what's the point of having a strong algorithm? People don't need to break it if they can compromise the top CA or if they can, um, whatever they can do. But some things never change. And I just do this and then I really will finish. Because this is now topical. Um, and these slides were written before Snowden, <laughs> before I'd even heard of Snowden. In fact, these slides now are 20 years old. Um, the widespread use of encryption for confidentiality has always been a cause of concern for governments. And I think there's nobody's going to dispute that. And the simplified version of, let's say, the UK government's permission, because various governments have different positions, but the UK government's position is they are happy to support the use of strong encryption for good purposes. And the good is in inverted commas, because I'm not sure what it means. But they're unhappy about the use of strong encryption for bad purposes. And there's not anybody in this room who would, I think, strongly object to that. But you might, have all, might all have different concepts of what good was and what bad was and where personal rights come in and where national security comes in and where all sorts of things come in. And so the problem with all of this now is concepts of what is good, what is purpose and what, what is rights and so on. So you have this picture. And I say this slide really is 25 years old, at least. So it's not a new problem. Read any book published in cryptography in the early 1980s and they'll all have this problem. And most of them will say the sender and the receiver were going to be the banks and the interceptor was going to be the villain. And then in, was it 1991, I think it was, the American government came along and said, oh, you got it all wrong. We're the good guys. We're also the interceptors. And we have to intercept to protect you from nasty things and paedophiles and whatever else. And so there is a now a genuine dilemma. And I'm not interested in trying to tell you what the answer should be. But you do have to understand that there are two sides to this coin. And Law enforcement, or look, national security, wherever you want to call it, has a genuine dilemma. The first point, I personally believe, I don't think they care what I as an individual get up to in my spare time. If I've got a mistress in every single town in the country, they couldn't give a toss. It's not their business, and they don't care. They certainly don't want hinder e-commerce, they certainly want to have their own secure communications. They occasionally, and how occasionally is, maybe occasionally, now post Snowden you might have a concept that's more occasionally than it was before Snowden, but whatever, use interception to obtain information, and they occasionally need to read confiscated encrypted information. Now, what does that mean? Go back a slide. That means sometimes law enforcement wants to be on the horizontal line, and sometimes law enforcement wants to be in the vertical line. Well, if you want to be in the horizontal line, you want encryption that's unbreakable. If you're in the vertical line, you want to break the encryption that's being used. Unfortunately for government, we don't know how to design an algorithm that's strong when the good guys use it and weak when the bad guys use it. So there's a dilemma there. And it is a genuine problem. 
Now, I lecture a lot and talk to the students the whole way. And if you say, how many of you think you should have the right to encrypt emails? And every hand goes up. How many of you think that paedophiles should have the right to send encrypted images right around the universe? Oh no. I just stop it. Well, 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 oh no, oh. I haven't thought about that. And, and the same thing goes up. So there is a genuine dilemma there. And I'm just glad it's not my decision. <laughs> because the, the rights of the individual to privacy and whatever you want to, and the, um, the needs, perceived needs of law enforcement are often in conflict. And you have to talk about the perceived needs of law enforcement because the attackers often say, well, they can use other means to get the information. Um, so I have nothing more to say. I'm now going to finish. And what I'm going to finish is my favourite slide. My favourite slide of all time. A man called Newton Minow, who I thought was dead until unfortunately he turned up to me in the audience one time. But um, it, and there was, well, I didn't know him, it's alright, he wasn't... Um, he's very much alive and apparently he's now quite famous for having educated Obama when Obama was a student. I didn't, I didn't know that either. But he did a comprehensive study in 1985. It's out of he's finished the, of European comparative law. And here's his conclusions. In Germany, under the law, everything is prohibited except that which is permitted. In France, under the law, everything is permitted except that which is prohibited. In the Soviet Union, under the law, everything is prohibited, including that which is permitted. And in Italy, under law, everything is permitted, especially that which is prohibited. Now, you're smiling and you're supposed to smile, but there's a very element of truth there. And when we start looking at standardising how to behave on the internet, when you start looking at agreed modes of behaviour, even the Europeans were better agree. So how are you going to get worldwide agreement for... This is a big issue. And there I'll just stop, thank you. I've finished.